Tonight, as we look at Galatians chapter 6, we're going to be talking about the marks of a servant. Marks of a servant. What does it mean to be a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ? When Peter penned his epistle almost some 2,000 years ago, he talked about how Christ had left us an example by which we could follow in his steps, 1 Peter 2, 21. And Jesus, as you know, humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And Paul said in Philippians 2 and verse 7, in that same context, that he took upon him the form of a servant. Since Jesus came to serve the human family, it would only stand to reason that we would look to him and look at him as a model for our behavior even today as the people of God. When Paul wrote to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 5, he says, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus our Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Paul understood this concept of servanthood. And those of us who belonged in the body of Christ, we too must come to understand and also to appreciate the importance of being a servant as well. And so what does it mean to be a servant? Well, there are two things that I want to share with you tonight as we look at Galatians chapter 6, as we contemplate the title, The Marks of a Servant. The first priority set forth by Paul is to restore the disorderly. And really what Paul is talking about here is that those of us who are faithful members of the body of Christ, that we do everything within our power to be able to reach out, and that is to convert the apostate. Now, an apostate is somebody who has gone out. For example, in 2 Peter 2, verse 15, Peter talks about those of which have forsaken the right way and have gone astray. And so at some point in time, they made a decision in their mind to abandon the very principles of the New Testament Christianity. And so you and I, as servants of Jesus Christ, as people of God, we have the responsibility to restore the disorderly. That is, to convert the apostate, those who have gone out and gone back into a life of sin. You know, you can read in the New Testament of individuals who have abandoned the faith of men like Hymenaeus and Alexander and Philetus and Demas, to name a few. Well, these were individuals that at one time had been faithful members of the body of Christ only to leave the Lord. And by the words of the Apostle Peter, having forsaken the right way and are gone astray. Let's notice for just a moment about the road that is leading away from God. When you think about serving God, it's really a two-way street, isn't it? The first thing that we want to talk about is this road that leads away from God. Unfortunately, as is the case when sometimes individuals make a decision to abandon the faith, to forsake what they know to be right and truth, I want to suggest that the road that leads away from God begins with what we might call a detachment from that which is the spiritual, the spiritual things. And as we think about this, what occurs is that people are forsaking spiritual Activities. Now, there are two possibilities when it comes to our spiritual lives that we either can neglect our spiritual lives or we can nurture our spiritual lives. There's only one of the two ways. Well, what we want to do is to nurture it, right? We want to try to do everything that we can to build up the inner man. That is to strengthen the inner man that we know and read about in the Bible. Now, what about those who are detached from the spiritual. Well, there are three things that I think happens in the lives of people who become unfaithful. First of all, they will begin forsaking the assembly 
in their worship to God. What does it mean to be detached from the spiritual? Well, first and foremost, people begin to neglect their worship to God. All, and I really think that one of the problems is, is that we fail to understand just what worship is really all about. You see, the word worship means acts of reverence paid to deity. And so you and I, we have the opportunity to pay God the homage or the reverence that he is due. Because he's our creator, right? He is our sustainer. He is our redeemer. He's the one who reconciles us. And so we have this great relationship that has been afforded to us through the sending of Jesus Christ. And so what we want to do is to make sure that we pay God the homage on a regular basis. Do you remember what Jesus said in John 4 and verse 24 when he said, God is spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And in verse 23, he said, speaking of God, the father, that the father seeks such to worship him. God is interested in our worship. He's interested in it. I think sometimes we miss that very thing, that God is interested in people worshiping him and bowing before him in prostration. Now, I'm reminded of the words of the psalmist in Psalm 95 and verse 6, who said these words. He says, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down, right? Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. And so unfortunately, there are people that are even in the body of Christ who do not take seriously their worship to God. They will neglect that worship. And you can see it in the past that our numbers are smaller on Sunday night than they are on Sunday morning. We can see it in the online of how the numbers are smaller of those that are even watching tonight, right? And Wednesday night, then on Sunday morning. It's just a pattern. It's a habit. And once you get into that habit, well, it's hard to get out of it. And so detachment from the spiritual. And it begins by forsaking our worship to God. A second thing, and that has to do with forsaking the word of God. The word of God. If you close the word of God in your spiritual life, you're headed for trouble. That's no doubt. I can promise you that. But think about for a moment about how necessary it is for us to take the right kind of physical diet. We want to make sure that we eat regularly. I don't know of any of us that miss a meal on a regular basis. Well, here's what Jesus said. It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, Matthew 4.4. 4. What we have to do is feed on the word of God. Now, when people begin to focus on the worldly things and things that are carnal in nature to the neglect of God's word, something's going to suffer. That's all there is to it. Something's going to suffer. Something is going to... That something is going to be their spiritual life. That's what's going to suffer. How much time do you spend reading and studying and meditating on the truth of God? If you're not spending a portion of each day reading this particular book and trying to understand the contents of what we call the Bible, you're headed for trouble. Because ultimately you're detaching yourself from that which provides nutrition to your spiritual life. I always found it funny that a lot of times when we had the question box for our last Sunday of the, of the month for questions, and it got to a point where I was hardly getting any questions at all. In some cases, I even came up with questions, things that I had studied and I read, and it was like, you know, that would be a good study. I think I'll tell the congregation. Is it because we're not reading and studying and meditating on the Word of God? Because I guarantee you, if you're reading the Word of God, you're going to find something that you have a question about because you're reading it. Let's think about that when we get back to that, hopefully soon. Now, we're told by Peter 
that as newborn babes, that we're to desire the sincere milk of the word, that we may what? Grow thereby. 1 Peter 2.2. 2. There are parents in our society that have neglected feeding their children, and as a result, they have gotten in trouble with the law. Their children are not growing and are malnourished. But spiritually speaking, if we're not feeding on the Word of God, then we're not growing, and we become now nourished, and we're in trouble with the law of God, which is probably the most important law that we should not go against. Now, Peter said, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so as we think about this idea of being detached from the spiritually, the spiritual things, it begins by forsaking our worship to God, and then number two, forsaking the Word of God. And then finally, forsaking the work of God, right? Really, there is a correlation between all these three points. Individuals who are not interested in worshiping God on a regular basis are not interested in studying the Word of God. And you know that if they're not interested in the worship, they're not interested in the Word. And then they're not going to be interested in being involved in the work of God. As we talked even about this morning as well. There are those things that are necessary for the work of the church to exist. And one example would be our worship service, right? There are certain responsibilities that have been entrusted unto us that participate in the worship. And when those responsibilities are delegated, we need to make sure that we are here to fulfill those duties. When somebody is assigned to lead a public prayer or to read the scripture or to wait on the Lord's table, surely we want to be responsible enough to make sure that we're here to do that. If there is a detachment in your life with regard to the spiritual, it's going to be reflected on how you either come or absent yourself from the worship. It is going to be reflected on whether or not you're reading the Word of God and is going to be reflected in your work for the cause of Christ. That's a shame when people have responsibilities and they do not fulfill their responsibilities. I've seen guys that had the responsibility of making sure everybody is ready to go and worship on Sunday morning or Sunday night. And you know what? Sometimes they can't find anybody that are supposed to be serving. Where are they? What would you think about it if I did not show up on Sunday night? What would you think that if I, I did not show up on a Sunday morning and somebody says, well, that's your job and, and, and you're right, it is. But the point is, I have a responsibility and I take that responsibility to heart. It is my responsibility to be in this pulpit every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, and then I've been doing a, a Wednesday night service from my office but I feel that that's a responsibility. And I don't want to neglect that because I, I feel like I'm neglecting my God. And I want that for you. And so a detachment from the spiritual. But then there's a detachment from the spiritual that leads to a development of the sinful. And again, there's some correlation here as well. When you become detached from the spiritual things, overall, what is going to happen? You're going to develop some habits that are unbecoming of a member of the body of Christ. Ultimately, that relationship that you enjoy with God is going to be severed. How so? Well, first of all, what typically happens is that people will begin sliding into a life of sin. Now, now when we talk about somebody who's apostatized from the faith or has left the faith, I, I don't think it's something that just occurs overnight. It, it's a process. It, it begins with just a little bit here and a little bit there. And then it's, oh, well, I guess if I, if I didn't, well, I don't need to do that. And the next thing you know, we never see them again. We try to call them. They don't answer because they see the caller ID, know it's me or know it's somebody from the church. And they will avoid them. And they will try to stay away from them. They have now slid into a life of sin. It's a process. And there are a series of choices that we make in life 
that lead to a development of a life of sin. Let me give you an example of this. Go to Luke chapter 15, verse 11 and following, and here we read about the prodigal son who asked his father for his inheritance. Guess what? Well, the father granted that which in the Bible says, verse 13, and not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. That's mistake number one, isn't it? He went out into that far country. He got his inheritance. He took that money. He got his friends and he said, let's go. We're going to have a good time, right? As Jesus said, well, there he wasted his substance with riotous living. All of that which had been entrusted into his care, he did not take the responsibility with it and just blown it on everything and anybody and everybody. He wasted it with riotous living and blew it all. Everything that his father had entrusted into him. And what you see here is somebody who is sliding into a life of sin. He went out and started indulging in things that he had no business doing at all. And so it was a process, right? A process. And then what happens is ultimately as we go from sliding into a life of sin, we become submerged into this life of sin submerged to the point that there might not be any hope of getting out. There are people today that are in the body of Christ, sadly, who have been baptized into Christ, and they have left the Lord and now are submerged into a life of sin, and they don't want to have nothing to do with you. They don't even want to hear from you. Those, I mean, it only makes one wonder why or whether or not they can even be reached, and why they did what they did. Now, in Luke 15, you read about the prodigal son who went into that far country. He wasted his substance with righteous living. But the Bible talks about how he ultimately hit rock bottom. And so Jesus says in verse 17 of that text, and when he came to himself, he came to a realization in his life that he had been doing what was wrong He had hit rock bottom, and thank God he came to himself, but he was head over heels into a life of sin. And so if you become detached from the spiritual, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to develop a life of sin. And so we talk about this road that leads away from God. But what about the road that leads back to God? Is it possible for me to find my way back home the prodigal son did didn't he when he came to himself well how would it be possible for me to find my way back from this life of sin well let's look at galatians 6 as we talk about restoring the disorderly the first thing that we have to do as a servant of almighty god when we know when somebody has become in unfaithful we have to go and try to convert the turncoat. And really, that's what an apostate is. They are a turncoat. They are a wayward member of the body of Christ. They are unfaithful. Now, look at what Paul said in verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault in any trespass, here's somebody who's been submerged into a life of sin. And as a child of God, has now become an unfaithful member of the body of Christ. What Paul is saying here is that it is my responsibility. It is your responsibility as well to restore them, to reach out to them, to try to do what? Try to convert them, try to bring them back home. In James 5 and verse 19, James says, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way. That's what happens. When a person becomes an apostate, a turncoat, when they go back into the world, they have to be reconverted. No, they don't have to be rebaptized, but there has to be a conversion process process. 
Once again, there has to be a change of mind that leads to repentance. Paul said, for godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation, 2 Corinthians 7, 10. And this is exactly what has to take place. And there has to be this conversion process. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 through 26, Paul talks about those of us who are faithful children of God, that when we reach out to the erring, those who wandered away from the truth, that we correct them. You see, that's the idea. We're trying to convert them. We're trying to lead them back home. And so there is the conversion of the turncoat. But then there's the character of the teacher. You see, there are some things that I have a responsibility to implement in my life. In order to bring about the conversion of the disorderly member of the body of Christ, listen to what Paul says, verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, gentleness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. What was Paul saying here? He's saying that as a child of God, that you and I, that there is a certain demeanor that I need to bring to the table when I sit down with somebody who is apostatized from the faith. I need to have a very gentle, meek spirit, and meekness is really strength under control. Over in 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26, Paul said that as a servant of the Lord must not strive, but he be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. There are certain traits that I need to bring to the table in this conversion process. I don't have to go whip somebody. They're already down. Many times when you start talking to somebody who's apostatized from the faith, they know what they've done. Sometimes they'll begin the conversation. I know why you're here. I know what you're going to say. And then they will begin to spill the truth. Now, it may be the case that they don't. And we have to enlighten them from the Word of God. But we can still do it with the spirit of gentleness, in humility, if you will. We can do it in the right way. Paul talks about speaking the truth in love. A few years back, talking to a gentleman there had been a, that had been a faithful gospel preacher and got his life all messed up. He had left the church. He actually left his family and stayed out of the church for many, many years. And when he was restored, he said that it was because of the people that he was dealing with in this restoration process, it was because of their attitude. Their attitude and the way they handled it that helped him come to his senses. He said, I could have gone either way. But you know, they were kind and they were compassionate. They were gentle. And in that process, it led to the restoration of his soul. And now he's faithful in preaching again. Look also, if you will, to what Paul said here in Galatians 6.1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fall to you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself lest thou also be tempted. Let's just say that there's somebody out here that has become unfaithful to the body of Christ. We know what they've done. They've gone out and they're committed some kind of spiritual adultery. They're unfaithful to the body of Christ. And so we go and we talk to them and we sit down and we look at him and we say, well, I'll tell you one thing. It never happened to me. How do we know that? Paul said, considering thy yourself, lest thou also be tempted. Here's what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. We don't need to have this elder brother complex that says, listen, it's not going to happen to me. 
You don't know that. I'm above that. No, you don't know that. But by the grace of God, it could have been us. What we want to do is to make sure that our spiritual lives are intact, that we are faithful to the Lord. And if somebody is unfaithful, we want to take the right approach in restoring them back to the Lord. Now, does that mean that we have to make concessions and compromise the truth of Almighty God? No. Never is there any place for compromise when it comes to the truth of God's Word. But there is the need to have the right attitude, right? In talking to people who have become unfaithful, wayward members of the body of Christ. And really, when you, when you read over in 2 Thessalonians 3, in verse 6, when Paul talks about withdrawing yourselves from every brother that walks disorderly, that, that word disorderly is a military term. It means to break rank, and, and that's what's happened. They're out of step. They've broken rank. And so what we're trying to do is to get them back in step, back in rank, if you will, to get them back in harmony with the will of God. And so there is the conversion of the turncoat. There are the characteristics of the teacher, and it takes both in order for this process to work. But that, let me just make this observation before we close tonight. And it may be the case that you know somebody tonight who at one time was a faithful brother or sister in Christ to the Lord. They're not watching tonight. They weren't here this morning. They haven't been here in a long time. You know who they are. You know somebody who's not been faithful. Why not just pick up the telephone, give them a call, let them know that you're thinking of them. Uh, just send them a card and let them know. Why not talk to them about their spiritual life? You see, God is interested in people who have become unfaithful because he wants them to be faithful once again. You see, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all will come to repentance, 2 Peter 3, 9. Secondly, a second mark of a servant is first of all, we are to restore the disorderly, but second, we are to relieve the burden, right? And that is we're to care for the afflicted. You know, there are certain things that God wants us to do as his people. And so in verse 2, here's what Paul said, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We can begin by comforting the burden. Those of us who belong to the very body of Christ, we are in essence burden bearers, right? Paul said, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. You know, in the book of Job, you read about the trials and the adversities that he experienced in his life. And I'm not sure that I've ever known anyone on this planet that has faced such same losses that he has faced, that, that has faced the same human suffering and misery that this man did. There, there may be other people out in the world that have met similar fates in life, but this man suffered greatly. He lost his 10 children. He lost his wealth. He lost his own health. His own wife turned on him and said, why don't you just curse God and die? Well, in chapter 2 of Job, we read about the three friends of Job. And the Bible says that they made an appointment together to, to come and to mourn with him and to comfort him. Is, is that not what Christianity is all about? It is. We are bound together as members of the body of Christ. We're people of like precious faith, according to Second Peter 1 and verse 1. We enjoy fellowship with one another based on Acts 2.42. We have fellowship vertically with God, horizontally with one another. And as a result of that, we have the privilege of comforting the burdens of life. I mean, just look at the life of Jesus. Have you ever thought about how Jesus sought to comfort others? I, I said just a moment ago that in Acts 10 and verse 38, that it was said about Jesus that he went about doing good. You know, one of the things that he did was is he reached out and tried to provide comfort to the burdened. 
You know, there were a lot of people that he met in his three and a half years of ministry here upon this earth. And in that short tenure here on this planet earth, he had the opportunity, the privilege, the comfort, the burden. Now, Paul said in Romans 12 and verse 15 that we are weep, we are to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. When people are facing illness and disease, when they are discouraged, when they're down, when they've lost their job, when they're facing financial adversity, when they've lost a loved one, do we not have the privilege of trying to help those members of the body of Christ to alleviate to some extent their sorrows? Yes. In John 11, when you read about the death of Lazarus, you read about a host of Jewish people that came together to mourn with Mary and Martha. And so you and I, as God's people, we have the opportunity to care for the afflicted, right? We can comfort the burden, but then also we have the compassion, we're to have compassion on the burden. In Mark chapter 1, verses 40 through 45, we read about a leper who came to Jesus and, you know, lepers were outcasts. They, they always had to cry, unclean, unclean, so that anybody that would, might get near them would, would stay away from them. They were social outcasts. It was a very contagious disease, and so they would let people know to stay away. But there were certainly ceremonial provisions set forth in the law dealing with those who had the plague of leprosy. But nonetheless, it was a leper who came to Jesus. And the Bible says in verse 40 of, of Mark 1, that he knelt before Jesus and imploring him and saying, Lord, if thou will, can thou make me clean? Mark said in verse 41, And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him and said unto him, I will be thou clean. What did Jesus do? He had compassion on this man. When Paul said, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ, it means that we as God's people ought to be compassionate of one another. We talk about sympathizing and empathizing with people. There are times in life when I can sympathize with the miseries and the difficulties of another person. And yet there are times, other times in life when maybe I have encountered several similar adversities. And so I can empathize with a fellow member of the body of Christ. I know what that person's going through. There are times in life when we need to have some compassion. You know, in Hebrews 4 and verse 15, it says how Jesus as our great high priest was compassionate and we need to have compassion as well. Paul talks about bearing one another's burdens. It's only when we reach out to help others that we can become like Jesus. We can also include when we reach out to those who are lost in sin that we become like Jesus. Why? Because those are the marks of his servant. And so we are to, first of all, according to the Apostle Paul, here in Galatians 6, we are to reach out and be a burden bearer. And then also, we are to be benevolent. What, what does it mean to be benevolent? Look at verse 10 of Galatians 6. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, and especially unto them who are the household of faith. When we talk about being benevolent, we're talking about being charitable. Taking things that we have that have been entrusted in our care and using them for the good for others. An example of this would be found in Matthew 25. When Jesus talks about that final day of judgment, and in Matthew 25, 34... Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was a hungered, and you gave me meat. 
I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in, naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. But Jesus said in verse 40, that inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Benevolence. Jesus, James said in, in James 1.27, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. He's not talking about just paying them a visit. It's good to make house calls and visit people, but he's talking about rendering aid to those people, trying to help them from a financial perspective. We're trying to help them with the necessary components of life to be charitable. If we really want to be a servant, what are we going to do? We're going to be burden bearers. We're going to, be, we're going to understand that we need to bear the burdens of others. And then we're also to be benevolent. We're to reach out and try to help people. Now listen again to what Paul said. As we have therefore opportunity, verse 10, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. I know there are a lot of people out there that are running scams. I understand that. I see it time and time again. I've had many to come here to the church bell. You would not believe some of the things that I've seen just being in the church building on a regular basis. Many times it's the same story, just a different person, just a different face. We're not talking about people that are running scams, but people who have legitimate needs, legitimate needs. Paul is saying as a child of God, when those opportunities arise and we can step out and step up and alleviate their burdens, we ought to do that. We ought to be helpful. Because that's, what's being a, that's what it means to be a child of God. Question. Are you the kind of servant that Jesus is looking for? Do you remember that Peter wrote about Christ leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps? 1 Peter 2.21 Are you following in the footsteps of the servant Jesus? It begins by obeying the gospel, by coming to the realization that without Christ you're lost and dying in sin, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, John three sixteen and 17. It begins by our obedience. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God? Are you willing to repent and turn from a, a life of sin to a, a, a life of doing what God has asked you to do? To confess his sweet name and be baptized in that watery grave for the remission of your sins? As Peter instructed on Pentecost Day, as was recorded by Luke in Acts 2.38 and 41, to repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And then they that gladly received the word were baptized, and there was added unto them about 3,000 souls. That was on the day of Pentecost. If they could do it, we can do it. And if we do that, the Bible says that God will add us to the church, Acts 2 47. You have to be in the church because the church is the community of the say. That's where the redeemed reside Ephesians 5 23 maybe you're watching tonight maybe you're not faithful we've talked a moment ago about those who walk disorderly those who are no longer faithful maybe you've not been in step with Jesus maybe you are not what you ought to be and you know that well then you can Make things right, even tonight. Call me, write me, text me. Let me know. Let's pray with you and for you. You know what James says in James 5, 16, that we're to confess our faults one to another and pray for one another. We have the privilege to pray with you and for you. And the Bible says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness 
righteousness. First John one nine. Can we help you even tonight? We'll hope that.